Hello. Boys, girls, how you going? It's the first um, video in a while. Just haven't felt like I'm uh, doing much worth reporting. But uh, bugger it, let's do a video. Keeps me focused. Welcome to Brad's Guitar Garage. There's the door. Garage door. And today, we've got the usual problems with the Hot Rod Deluxe. It's a uh, bread and butter kind of repair. They come in all the time <clears throat> with the same issues, regardless of the year. Some are slightly better than others. Some are worse. Um, so yeah, let's, I've checked that it's not got any catastrophic faults. Uh, so let's power it up and I'll show you the issues it's got. I'll feed it some signal. Um, we'll just go through what it's actually doing first and then I'll physically show you what's wrong. So I'll fire up the uh, signal generator up there. 400, 400 hertz. And let's fire it up. This is the... Uh, First video since we got the NBN, so we'll see if the quality is any better than the previous videos. Of course, I up upload these in high def later on, on on YouTube, so you can jump on there and have a look if you want to see the nitty gritty. Um, but yeah, I kind of fucked up and got the crappy NBN. I didn't realize there was different tiers. I thought NBN was just super duper NBN. Um, we got NBN 12, which from what I'm told is really only suitable for VOIP phone service <laughs> so we're about where we were before but hopefully it's a little bit more consistent not going up and down in the bitrate as much as the crappy ADSL we had so anyway let's see how it goes and if you want to watch it have a look at the YouTube channel and you'll see in high def see all my uh, freckles in high def being a ranger anyway those heaters are warmed up now so let's fire it up. I'll just center everything. Turn the master down, turn the reverb down, just to start with. And fire it up. So let's plug the signal in, might be a good idea, eh? <laughs> oh, well, first thing, that, that jack's really loose. So it's probably got cracked solder joints, or if not already, they will be soon. All right, so we're getting signal. Just knock that down a touch, it's a bit annoying. All these amps, they go from no signal. If I put that to roughly the level that a guitar's gonna be, that's zero, that's like one, and that's, that's two. It jumps really quick, and I think the principle behind that is they want you to go to a guitar shop. Oh, wow, look how loud it is. It's only on two. Man, this thing must rip. But, you know, there's no improvement above three. There's just the headroom gets lower and lower. So, I don't know if it was intentional as a marketing thing or not. But anyway, I'll shut up for a sec. I'll have a listen. Give it some triangle waves so I can test the uh, tone. Sine wave doesn't have enough um, enough harmonics to really test the tone controls that well. So the treble's working, not not scratchy. That's good. There's probably no DC on it um, from leaking coupling caps. Can't tell if the bass is really working at that frequency. <laughs> giggles a little bit when I do that. It's like they're having flashbacks of Doctor Who or something. Mid-range works. Let's test the reverb. Turn it up about halfway. Change the frequency. You'll be able to hear it echo. There's nothing. 
No reverb. Presence works. Sweet as. Uh, just grab a meter, test the bias. I've already tested this, but I'll just show you. <clears throat> So the stock bias for these things was 60 millivolts. It's a bit cold, but at least safe. So to start off, we'll just measure for that. Uh, there's the meter. There's the bias test point. We get 50, 50, well, a little bit unstable, but about 56 millivolts. That's across a one ohm resistor for the two tubes. So that's we have 56 for 56 millivolts between them, which is being a one ohm resistor that equates to milliamps cathode current. Uh, so that's safe. It's not going to blow anything up. Now let's test the channel switching. Oh, I'll test the normal and bright first. Yeah, it appears to do what it should. I'll give it a square wave. appreciably brighter more drive oh that doesn't work too you just click the channels oh, the channel switching isn't working now that click there is from the switch but I can't hear the relays clicking if you just gently push that switch in before it clicks you normally hear the relays kicking in and out that's these two black things over here but they're not so something's wrong there um, yeah, so uh, let's power it down. I'll just check that those caps are discharging okay, which they will be, but I just like doing idiot checks on video so no one goes, Oh, you didn't do it, and I electrocuted myself. You're to blame. Um, so DC volts. Just put it straight across that cap. The capacitors are the things that hold charge. I'll unplug it from the wall first. <clears throat> Got about 20, 25 volts. Eh, it's not going to kill me. It's still going down too. The tubes are still a little bit warm. Uh, yeah, it's slowly going down. They've got, um, I believe they've got a bleeder resistor in there. Anyway, so. I'll show you some damage and then we might fire it up again. We'll check some voltages. But just looking at it, I already know what's wrong. It's the same as all these things. And let's grab the camera without dropping it, hopefully. So, um, first issue these caps just suck. Uh, IC brand caps, that's Illinois capacitor. Um, they always fail, and if they haven't failed yet, it's only a matter of time till they do. Normally, you see schmoo leaking out of the bottom of them there, um, physically, chemically leaking its crap, its electrolyte, um, but if not, they start crackling, popping, making weird background noises or just humming. Um, now that there, that's the low voltage supply. So you've got two xenodiodes there, and they are labelled CR13 and CR, CR14. Um, they're re sort of regulators in combination with these two power resistors, they regulate to plus minus 15 volt. For the op amp, which is here, that's the reverb circuit, and that also powers these relays, those two black things there. Now they do the channel switching, uh, and if their coils can't be energized because there's no voltage, no channel switching. So we've got a failure of the low voltage supply, um, but I'll show you that with voltages later on. Um, the biggest problem with these amps, if one of these comes in in stock condition, um, I can fix it no problems. Um, 
and it'll give a real long life afterwards. But everyone seems, I don't know what it is about this amp in particular, um, but everyone seems to want to have a go at fixing it themselves. Maybe it's because it's so common and there's so much bullshit about them on forums. Oh, you can fix it. Yeah, have a go. You know, it's a piece of piss. But these guys, they don't have the right gear. They don't, they're not used to soldering. They, they've got no idea about how to repair, you know, they'll, they'll say, oh, replace this part. Okay, sure, you can replace the part, but look at the soldering. Someone's had a go at this one. You can tell because they've marked, <laughs> they've marked the components they need to change with the texture on the bottom of the board because, you know, like you flip the board and your three-second memory dies. Um, he's burnt He's burnt the cable, the ribbon connector there with his soldering iron as he's been pushing in there trying to get past it. Um, I say he, because I think women are smarter than this. <laughs> um, you can see the quality of the soldering there. Hasn't cleaned the flux off. Probably burned the pads. These pads, this copper traces, this this copper that you see in there, the little tracks, that's literally just copper foil glued to fiberglass. Now, if you heat that shit too much, the glue lets go. And then they start peeling off the board and then you've got to, got to make up traces again using bits of wire and it becomes a real mess now almost every one of these that someone's worked on they've got a i don't know bunnings soldering iron or something and they've heated the shit out of the pads and they've destroyed the traces so i have to remake them if, and even worse maybe they've tried to repair the traces themselves and just made a dog's breakfast out of it with like friggin fencing wire gauge copper wire and most of the cost in it is repairing their repairs so it's best you just bring it to me, give me your money, instead of giving someone else your money and then giving me your money anyway. And uh, I'll make it work for another 20 years. So anyway, what I'm, do <laughs> what I'm doing is, see that writing there? How it's gone brown? They're the stock tubes, or oh, valves, I've been talking to too many sepos. They're the stock valves that come with these amps. Um, and this amp's dated, well, the board's dated 96, so it's somewhere between 96 and I think 2002 they brought out the reissue. So late 90s, early 2000s, it probably is a 96. Uh, I was in grade six, I was still in primary school when this amp was built. And those tubes were probably made a year before that, and they've probably been in there since. Um, looks like they've gotten a bit hot, but maybe someone's dialed back the bias at some point because um, it didn't come in running too hot, but they're pretty tired anyway. I don't think those tubes are going to sound very good or put out the rate of power. Uh, so I'll change them out and I'll repair all this. So I'm going to put new resistors and new zenodiodes because they're 5 watt resistors. So you've got 10 watts of heat there. Right next to it, you've got a 5 watt zener. So that's another. 10 watts, so it's 15 watt of heat coming out there, and then over here you got another 5 watt zener, so another 5 watts of heat coming out there, or up to, um, and then you got capacitors between them being nicely heated, now capacitors don't like heat, and they fail prematurely because of that, and you've got heat rising onto this one here, because uh, this is the way up, heat goes up, uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll redo that, I think that there's nothing wrong with these components, but it's probably got damage to the solder and the traces on the other side of the board. So what I'm going to do um, is change the mount and have longer leads with some kind of strain relief uh, to space them away from the board to allow a bit of airflow around them and so there's not direct heat conduction into the board. Um, and same goes with this little resistor up here, which is part of the foot switch circuit. Um, that looks smaller than some of the other ones I've seen. I'm not sure if someone's replaced that. It looks dodgy. Um, but that could have been someone just probing around trying to find the problem. I don't know Anyway, all that's getting replaced. I'm not going a full hog on this and change invoicing options or, or Upgrading all the components the the bypass caps they're niche con. They're probably still all right um, They're pretty old, but There's no evidence that they're playing up This is a budget budget job um they wanted to spend as little money as possible to get it running again. Probably trying to sell it.
as, as I usually do. So I'll probably see the poor bastard that buys it and uh, he'll want it fixed up again. Well, voicing wise, it's going to be fine. It'll, it'll work fine. But the overdrive channel in these things does sound pretty terrible because of some silly decisions Fender made. Uh, so a lot of people get the voicing changed in them to make them a bit more usable on the overdrive channel. But anyway, that's that's not part of just getting it up and running again. That would be modification and, you know, upgrades. So anyway, they just want this thing working and reliable again. So I can do that. So let's fire it up again. We'll check some voltages and just confirm that we've got no low voltage supply. I already checked it, but I'll show you. Because I don't really know what I'm doing. I check stuff before I do a video. <laughs> My camera in there probably? No. Okay, there we go. So, pour it back up. Plug it in first, eh? Cafe current. I said cathode current, you dickhead. <laughs> Uh, just responding to chat. Alright. Now that low voltage supply, I believe, is switched on when it's in standby, so we don't have to switch on the high tension. We can check the low, low voltage supply in standby mode. <clears throat> Try not to get my arm in the way of the meter. Let's have a quick look at the schematic. If I can remember how. I made a shortcut for it. Where is it? There it is. Alright. So here's the schematic. Uh, here's the power supply. Mains comes in here. Uh, that's the primary of the transformer. Secondary here, that's the heater winds. You can see the 3.3, 3.3 volt. So, uh, well, yeah, AC. That's going into the light bulb. And then all the heaters uh, in parallel. And then they have pairs. So there's two heaters per preamp tube. And there's three, three of the preamp tubes shown there. And some balancing resistors. There's the high voltage, because uh, you can see the standby switch there. I'll go on arrow, maybe that'll look better. I don't know. Um, that's the standby switch there. And then you've got your rectification and your filter caps. You've got 47 microfarad, 500 volt, and then three 22 microfarad, 500 volt capacitors there with droppers in between them and the choke there. And that's your various voltages coming off. Uh, now down the bottom you've got this other winding. Now that's the one we're concerned about. That derives the bias voltage which comes out, they call it C minus. That goes to the output tubes to bias them. Uh, here's the rectifier for that and the filtering 100 microfarad, 100 volt capacitor for that and another one after the um, voltage dividing to make it adjustable. That's a 22 microfarad, 63 volt there. Now there's another tap taken from that down here. That goes across to, it's basically using the same rail to derive um, bias as well as your, your bipolar um, power supply. Because uh, the op amp requires plus minus 15, 16, 18, 20 volts. It doesn't really matter which, that can run on a range depending on what chip. Um, so it's got your plus and your minus coming in uh, well, that's just AC coming in there. That the rectifier direction determines whether it's plus or minus. So this is your minus rail. That's your plus rail. 48 volts, minus 48 volts. Now that's way too high and low. Uh, goes through your first filtering stage. Uh, 100 microfarad, 100 volt. Two, two of them there. You got a dropper resistor here, which forms your regulator with a xenodiode. Now xenodiodes are a bit weird. They, they sort of clamp the voltage at whatever voltage they're set to. So a 1N5353B xenodiode um, 
clamps it at 16 volts. I believe that's a 16 volt one. 53, yeah, 5353 is the 16 volt, 5352 is the 15 volt, I believe, unless I'm wrong. Uh, so that regulates it down past this point here it becomes well, on this side of the resistor it becomes 16 plus minus and then this is the final stage of filtering there now this is where we've got a problem uh, so I'll go back to the camera no there we go and uh, that's those two parts there so let's see what we've got on just go from ground. We on? Yeah, we're on. From ground to say, well, it doesn't matter which side of the resistor. Let's have a look. So we got minus seventeen point three there. It's probably within tolerance. And we got nothing there. We got forty six volts there. 49. Alright, so at the bottom of them is the input. Let's zoom in. This is hard to do. Alright, so the bottom of them is the input. So I'm getting minus, say, 50 volts there. And then 47 volts there. And then up here I'm getting minus 17. And now I'm getting fuck all. So I think that might be open or a bad connection. Or bad connection there. Nah. Anyway, there's damage there, I think. Uh, let's test if it's actually a blown component or not. Yeah, I'm getting for 450 ohm so it's probably a circuit board problem itself the resistor is probably fine but I'm gonna reinstall a new one anyway as I said to have longer leads so there you go buggered power supply so we'll solve that first and then what I might do I'll show you well I got it plugged in I'll show you the weird noises it's making which I suspect is the filter caps. Could be a coupling cap too, but we'll suss that out when we get to it. All right, got me warmed up. Turn the mask down. Well, not that that matters. The lead channel's dead. Can you hear that sort of? crackling in the background. Seems like something cooking, baking. It's usually the caps breaking down. So I'll just chop sticking around to see if there's any uh from oh something there yeah many issues tapping that cap low voltage one seems to do something as well but could be the cap breaking down could be shitty solar connections. Seems to be a hum there that's fluctuating as well. It's going up and down. I don't think that's from the mains. Just listen. Yeah, all sorts of background noises. Could be socket related too. Normally it would be more dramatic would really show up just touching him that's the most sensitive one there that's the input one oh yeah oh a little bit microphonic oh I think that tube might be on the way out oh. 
Yeah, she's <laughs> she's on the way out. So that could be the source of the crackling as well. Uh, so essentially, with the caps are partially used by um, these these things will fail, and I don't want to do a repair and then it'll come back in six months and it'll be like, yeah, sure, it's out of warranty, but there's that whole you want to keep people happy thing um, and they sort of take it to the nth degree when you start doing that. So they'll bring it back in 12 months or 18 months or two years and go, oh, yeah, you worked on it, but it's doing it again. Go, yeah, it's because you didn't want to change the caps because it was too expensive. That one there is about 15 bucks. That one there is about 10, 10, 10 bucks. So it adds up. These little ones are two or three bucks each, but you know, you still got to order them and ship them out. Um, I usually hold stock of them. But sometimes I forget to order them. <laughs> so they bring it back and it's got the same problem because you didn't replace stuff that's on the way out. And I don't like that. I don't like doing shit twice for free. So I'll just say, well, this needs to be done. If you don't want to pay for it, then I can't solve your problem. Um, yes or no. And that's treated me pretty well so far. So let's get to work, eh? I've got some parts I don't have. I don't have the 22 microfarad uh, 500 volters. I've got to order some of them. I've got the 47 microfarad 500 volters. I've got all the low voltage gear. So we'll do that first. We'll clean up some solder joints, figure out what old mate was doing down here. If he's replaced them with the right parts, they look right. 100k. Pretty overrated, but they look right. Clean up solder, have a look at the damage to the bottom of this board, and have a bit of a laugh about it. So if you want to stick around, stick around. So the first thing we've got to do is denob it. Let's check that those caps are discharged again. Ad nauseum. Can't be too careful. 12 volts, what's that gonna do? If you attach it to your nuts, it might do something, but people do that for fun, so whatever's. Is anyone watching? Probably not. Might share it around to um, drag some people in into my lair. And the internet's slow when I'm streaming. Got no drop frames though. That's pretty good. computer Shared. Alright, pay attention. Back to work. So, gotta remove all these. I work on the circuit board in situ. I don't take the chassis out unless something drastically wrong has happened to the chassis. Like I had one where the uh, the power transformer in here was was held in in place by fencing wire. It's like they had taken they it's like they'd they'd taken the training off for some reason and then lost the bolts. So he wrapped uh, fencing wire through the bolt holes and then twisted it around <laughs> and it was just hanging off. Obviously, uh, yeah. Whenever, whenever someone says they can fix anything, I'm instantly suspicious. 
on a bloke that has nothing in his shed but a pair of pliers and some fencing wire and maybe some duct tape. Ooh, kinky. It's just starting to cool down. It's first time in a year I've worn a jumper. Bit late in winter this year. I've got these things, tube tube sockets, they're awesome. Use them for guitar, machine heads, you name it. I go over the shaft of the pot. A normal uh, socket wouldn't do that. You'd hit the end of the uh, the end of the drive. Oh fuck, that was tight. Some meathead's been in here before. Oh Jesus, never had them that tight before. <laughs> kind of like these amps. I don't like the sound of them, but I like the uh <laughs> I like the predictability of the repairs. It's getting pretty, it's usually pretty easy to quote them unless something real drastic's happened. <clears throat> well, these are a weird size if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah, they're not, not half inch. 13 mil, they're 14 something. It's two uh, different models, I think the 2002 and beyond ones had two different size jack nuts, whereas this one's got all the same, same style jacks. <coughs> The other one had, I think, bigger ones for the input and the foot switch, I think. One of them over there was big and those two were bigger anyway. Heavier duty, coarser thread. These are all the pissy ones that fall apart. It's like they realized and then uh, corrected themselves halfway through. It'll be real nerve wracking having a an amp in production. That'd be scary, man. Like, something goes wrong, you've already made 20,000 of them. What do you do? Lose money. That's what you do. Yeah, the guys that put stuff into production, they've got balls. Just remove the washers. Stuck down with bourbon and coke and beers <laughs> what's a hot rod deluxe without some bourbon spilt on it eh? alright remove the earth wire because you can't move the circuit board much without doing that another common problem in these amps which um, I don't know, it doesn't seem consistently to happen, but if you push these ribbon wires in too far and they're sort of sitting against the board, they can oscillate and have yeah, oscillation problems um, from probably cross torque between the board and, and these ribbon wires. So just moving them out, having almost a 90 degree bend in them and getting them as close to the back panel, because the back panel's got grounded foil on it. Um, getting them as close as you can to the back panel, which is grounded, seems to get rid of any oscillation issues. At least in my experience, other guys probably had different issues. <clears throat> Just removing the circuit board screw. Oh, Jesus, almost lost one. Removing the uh, circuit board screws. <laughs> Bought a ton of these uh, bias pots too, these little trim pots in here. Um, 
another one over there. Um, when Fender sends out these amps, they put a little dot, little blob of paint on the bias trim pot. This one's, yeah, you can see it, it's like red ink. And um, I guess that's so during transit, it, um, it doesn't move and change the bias setting that they've set in the factory. Uh, it's sort of like a Loctite, but what happens is the paint works its way between the conductive track and the, the contact. And if you turn it at all from that stock position, adjust it slightly, um, it's now insulated with a layer of paint and you lose bias because looking at the circuit, we'll just pull up the circuit again. Uh, so the bias supplies here. You got essentially voltage coming in through here. If you can see my little put a little hand thing there, the voltage comes through here, and then that forms a voltage divider that sets its bottom stop. Uh, so that sets a stop for the least amount of bias. And uh, well, yeah. So closer to ground, that's a negative voltage. So as the vo voltage goes up, so therefore closer to ground, your bias current increases. Um, now, if you lose contact between that wiper and the conductive track, the wafer, you've just lost your negative voltage altogether and the tubes will just run away. And once that cap discharges, you've just lost all bias. So putting a drop of paint on that thing is not a real good idea. So anyway, I ordered uh, 20 of them or something. They weren't cheap, but... They're very hard to find, so um, I ordered a crap load of them while I, while I was paying postage just for that problem in the future. So there you go. Right, let's pull this board out. Gently, gently. There we go. Try and Wash the wires down as much as I can. There we go. Oh yeah, look at that. <laughs> She's cooked, man. That's probably the worst one I've seen. Mm. Fucking hell. Um, yeah. It's a worry. I can see the cracks, all the joints. So we should be able to repair it. I, I think that those. <laughs> Those solder tracks are probably destroyed as well. This looks like th these have already been replaced at some stage and they've just replaced them with the same bloody thing. Fucking numb nuts. I hate amps that people have touched. Alright, anyway. Someone's changed that cap. You can see the sketchy ass soldering there as well. Just, like, when you've finished your soldering, it should look, it should look better than than factory your joints. They should look better than the factory ones, not worse. And clean up your flux for Christ's sake. The shit's corrosive, don't leave it there. It absorbs moisture too, it's not... Eh, anyway, no one's gonna listen, who cares? They're gonna keep doing what they do because they don't do this because they're into electronics, they do it because they're cheap. Work on their own gear. Let's do some soldering. All right, let's put some water in my little spongies. I've got two Heiko stations here. 474 desoldering station with a 815 lead free capable desoldering hand piece, which is very nice. This, this one here. <laughs> Gets blocked all the time, it shits me. Um, yeah, it's pretty good. I bought it when I already had a soldering iron. I just needed desoldering. Those sucker things, you know, the pump, pump sucking things, they're fucking useless, man. They work for single layer boards, but if, uh, single sided boards, but if you got through whole, uh, through plated, what am I trying to say? Through hole plated and <laughs> circuit boards, 
they can't suck the solder out of the center of the circuit board. Uh, single layer boards, the solder's just like on the face of the board. It doesn't go through the hole. Uh, those things can do that. And they can desolder those joints, but you get a three-plated board and you won't have a hope. You'll just destroy the traces trying by heating them for too long. I found this thing's good. I don't know what temperature it's at because the temp control is just numbers. I set it to about two and a half. Uh, if it's a big ground plane or something big, I'll set it to three. I might go up to four for pots, uh, the back of pots, that kind of thing, uh, in guitar work. Um, and it maxes out at six. Yeah, it's pretty good. I've got a pay station up there, an MBT, uh, with a desoldering um, hand piece as well as a new iron. I've just um, been waiting until I run out of tips on the Haycos before I switch over to that. I might give these as spares, good to have spares. Uh, then I've got the classic 936 station with a 907. Pretty old school, not really good for modern shit like computers or anything. Um, but for amps, it's fine. The new ones have the heating element in the actual tip, so when you replace the tip, you're replacing the heating element as well. And because it's so close to the tip, the the power delivery, the heat delivery is just almost instantaneous when it needs it, so you can solder the ground planes, that kind of thing. It's very quick quick to uh, pick up the heat. So that's my setup. Now, I don't want to touch these solder joints until I snip off the components on the other side. Because um, if I don't, and if I try and remove the components while I'm desoldering them, I'll probably damage the traces even more. So what I want to do is snip the parts off and then just remove their little lead. It's poking through. If I can get my pliers. <laughs> Jesus. It's like doing yoga. Alright, so I'm just going to go snippity-doo-dah. Fuck you, fuck you. I see caps. These uh, these caps are silicon to the board. Stop them bouncing around while you're playing because it is a combo. And the uh, oh, one just fell straight off. Normally they put up a bit more of a fight than that. Cool. Just having a look. You can see that one. That little one's just starting to leak chemically. So whatever they use to seal that shit inside the canister. Uh, this isn't going to work, is it? It's just a bit of white goo in that hole. <laughs> um... That crusty crap is the electrolyte leaking out, and because it's water-based, it um it evaporates off and leaves the uh the well, I don't know whatever the secret herbs and spices that make up the electrolyte are, and that stuff's corrosive too. I've I've removed not so much axials like this, but I've removed them off other circuit boards where their radials, their sort of standing end up like those ones these ones and it's leaked leaks out the bottom of the canister and starts eating circuit board traces i think it, it's similar to like engine coolant it's got glycol and stuff in it but i think it, by the time it leaks out it's undergone some kind of chemical degradation and it's it's able to uh destroy traces because i've seen it happen Cut the leads to those power resistors. Of course, I can't cut the leads to the radial caps, so I've just got to carefully remove them. They are 470 ohm, 10% 5 watt resistors made in Mexico. Those caps are really loose too, those solder joints are probably... Yeah, there's a bit of movement. Alright. Fire up the desoldering gun, get rid of some of that goo. Hopefully it doesn't block on me. 
Put some fresh solder in there so I can get some new flux happening. I could use gel flux, but the shit gets everywhere. I'd rather just use this. Just get the majority of the blobs off there first. And The solder sort of goes a uh, grey sort of crusty sort of colour rather than a nice shiny shiny silver look when it um when it gets too hot too. That's another telltale sign that components have overheated. Either because in this case they're the proper components, they're just not mounted in any way that can mitigate heat build up, or they're not properly rated components or some kind of faults happen and they've dissipated more heat than they should. Uh, that's one of them from memory, I think that's the other one. Yep. That's the Zener diodes and taken off now. That one just popped out, that's alright. Tweezers. Alright. They are one and five three five three made by someone in a sill. I can't remember what the logo is. <clears throat> I'd like to know what brands they are. I don't know. A bit nerdy like that. Uh, so I'll remove all the radial caps so they can all piss off. See 43. Forty, see, 39, 42, and 43. Let's remove them. They are in the low voltage power supply. Get some more light happening so you guys can see what's going on. These solder joints haven't really been um, exposed to much heat, but still don't look too bad, except for the one that old mate's changed. Might add a bit of flux to that. They clean the flux off in the factory, so if you're removing stuff, um, you really should add a touch more solder before you desolder it, just to help it go up the gun and not get stuck in the tip. Seems like it's starting to get blocked. It always happens on camera. Yeah, a bit of leakage on them too. On the way out. I see. Mark of the beast. Failing electrolytic caps is the main reason shit fails because they're expensive so everyone gets the cheapest ones and the cheap ones can't handle heat and they're almost always in power supplies where heat's being generated. You find TVs and shit beside the road, chances are you just can put new caps in them and they come to life. Remove those ones. I'll remove the one above it to see if 45 because it was right near the heat generating area this little one here I'm talking about Let's take that one out because she's seen some shit man to trace. That's how easy it is. Fast it. Add some more solder.
bloody top's getting blocked. Hear that? Got my little drill here. Clean out the tip. The flux goes hard in the tip. That's better. Last lead there. Yeah. That lead uh, trace going to those power resists is just lifted off the board, so it's going to be some uh, repair work required in that area. They felt loose before I even snipped off the leads, so I'll try and save what I can, what's left of the traces, but I think they're not, it's not going to happen. They're too badly damaged. Let's get the tweezers on the other side of the lead. So looking at that, uh, the trace going to the input of that resistor was broken, so that's why we went. At the, that's why we weren't getting anything. Ah, you bloody thing! Put a bit more solder on there. Here comes <laughs> the pad just came off. I landed on my soldering iron. Oh well. Awesome. I've desoldered the little sticks of wire, that little wires that are left on from where I snipped off the caps. Just easy to manoeuvre out a little wire without damaging anything than it is to pull the whole cap out. a bit of fresh solder on there to help take them off. The last one down the other end. Sweet 
chickens laying eggs. Seems like I'm living on a farm or something. It's next door neighbours, chickens. All right, all the little leads are removed. I'll just clean up the, uh, the pads, ready for the new caps to be installed. <laughs> The um, Hot Rod Deluxe, this one, has just um, caps across the B plus and the drop resistors to ground, whereas the uh, 500 volt caps, whereas the DeVille has a higher uh, high voltage B plus. So they run, what, 100 microfarad, 350 volts in series with a balancing, res well, two balancing resistors across them. And that effectively gives a 50 microfarad capacitor capable of taking the high voltage without, without needing a 600 volt cap, um, which no one really makes not for a reasonable price anyway. Let's get a sharp chisel and remove this silicon. Actually, I've got a better chisel for this. This one might dig in. I can never find anything when I'm doing a video. Alright. So this is a chisel I've made for sort of planing by hand with guitar work. Doing braces, that kind of thing. So it's got a different grind. Your average joinery chisel has a grind like that. So it's actually convex. Uh, sorry, concave <laughs> on the uh, the ground edge. Whereas this one's convex, so you can sort of change the angle of the chisel to adjust how much you're taking off. Normally it's razor sharp, but at the moment it's not. I've got to sharpen everything, but I polish them up afterwards. So, just carefully remove the silicon. Trying not to take off the silk screening. Man, do need to sharpen it. Normally I've got a more shaving sharp.
last one at the end. Hardest to get to. Gotcha. Sweet. And the surface is ready for some more silicon. When I get the caps, of course, which are on order. I use this stuff here. RTV, neutral cure, room temp... What? What's it called again? Room temperature vulcanizing, yeah. That's what it means. It's got to be a neutral cure, otherwise it can eat shit. Not good. Um, yeah, I looked around for ages trying to find a specific one for electronics, but um, I don't know. All the info seemed to be vague, and I think it was just the same shit as this anyway, just 10 times the cost. But yeah, I did a test on it. I put, put it on some leads and whatever and left it for ages, years ago, and it was fine. Uh, right, I'll check this. That socket looks a bit loose too, but I don't know, the soldering looks okay. I might just replace it. I mean, they're like three bucks. That one seems looser than this one. The soldering appears okay. It doesn't seem to be any movement there, but I might just replace that as a matter of course. Like I say, they're a couple of bucks each. I'd rather do it and not have the ant come back for it. Blocked again. Ah, oh, there it goes. They're pretty crappy jacks. They seem to fail pretty often. Yeah, I don't know what the logo means. It says USA patent and Japan patent. But yeah, that thread's pretty chewy anyway, which is probably why it's loose. So I'd put it replacing just for that. You can see, or maybe, which way? Wait, yeah. It's ripped the last couple of threads off there. And it only pokes up by one or two threads, so. Someone's over tightened it, or it's just rattled and worn itself in the hole. So I'll replace that one. The other one looks okay. Um, I might just touch up the solder joints, get rid of the old crappy solder, just to be sure. Probably another player that never uses input two anyway. In this thing, whether I like it or not. So that canister comes off, and that's the vacuum input. Yeah, she's pretty clogged. Ow, it's hot. It's all the solder in there. It's got this little springy thing, which collects the solder as well. You just sort of stretch it and you get, get the crap out. And empty it in a special lead only bin. <laughs> yeah. Still a little bit blocked. 
all this crappy dried up, well, ancient flux is probably uh, not helping because it burns and congeals in the tip. Right, where were we? And it's blocked again. I'm going to jack the temperature up a bit. Just give that a clean with some isopropyl. And grab my brush. Clean off that crusty flux. Yeah, pads look alright there. I don't think we've damaged them. Just gotta check that you've bottomed it out against the the bottom of the board, otherwise you can you can damage the uh, the traces pretty easily. I'll grab another jack. The fender style four pin. It's the same height. There's two heights of these too. You got to watch it. Um, you can order them and and uh, end up with the jack being in the wrong location, which is no fun for anyone. That one's right though. The overall height's a bit different, but um. I'm going to check that's the same time. It looks different. It looks more like this one. Oh, yeah. It's just a different brand. Sweet as, clean off the flux. Just give it a bit of a soak for a sec. And the flux from that solder is pretty pretty brutal. It's hard to clean off. The previous brand of solder wasn't too bad. This is the uh, Loctite. Multicore it used to be known as. Was, I think Multicore was the brand. That's the stuff anyway. I think the, 
the fox in it seems seems to go real nasty pretty quick. I'm not real happy with it. The previous brand of solder was just crap from JCar, and that that seemed seemed a bit less ridiculous with the flux. So what are we going to do about this bit? Have a go at it. Uh, zoomed in too far. There we go. So we've got no pad here at all. It's just burnt shit. That's the trace that goes down over there. This pad's hanging on by a thread. It goes past that one. And up here, I think that's connected there, but I think we've got a break right there. And that one's starting to lift off, but it only goes to there. These look suspect as well. I'll give this area a clean with ISO and hopefully we can see what exactly needs doing. It's pretty crusty. Being that there's no high voltages here, I don't think leakage through the board's a massive issue though. Although you've got plus minus 50 volts, so it's 100 volt difference. Hmm. Doesn't look as bad now, clean it up, but I'm going to need need to do something about these uh, ripped pads. Maybe put a, a little turret in there or something. Something that's riveted to the board. Something that can take up the strain, the mechanical strain. Because <sighs> once you've got no pad to solder to, you've got, you got nothing to really anchor that component in there. It's just going to flop around in the breeze. Get my components ready and have a dig around for some turrets or something. Four seventy eight. Seven what? It's a bit of an overkill. Oh no, got to order resistors too. So I've got these ones, similar to the ones that came out of it, cement, I believe they're called, like most people. So what I do is I just um, get my fancy forming pliers, bend them over. I have a value on top, so... Next bloke comes along can read it. I don't know if I was a complete nuffy or not. So I've got these pliers here, which are pretty cool. I just only just got these lead forming pliers. I used to use ceramic standoffs um, for everything, but they're pretty expensive. They're like a dollar something each. So what I do with these is you just put them on the lead like that. I'll zoom in a bit. Put them on the lead like that, if it would focus. Yeah. You just squeeze it. Oh, I've gone the wrong way. <laughs> oh, I'll do that one to match. And now you've got little kinks. Is it stop it from pulling into the board? That should be the other way around. I'll grab another resistor and do it properly. It's hard to concentrate while you're on video. <clears throat> Just flatten them out first. Sweet as. Yeah, I want to go that way. Kink it in. Kinky. Squeeze them. 
Bam. There's your little retaining, retaining kink. It's also good for um, components that undergo thermal expansion. So say you're uh, say you're doing a um, turret board construction. Oh, I've gone the wrong way again. <laughs> oh, I've got to put down the video camera. Um, say you're doing a turret board construction where the, the pins go straight out and connect to the solar connections on the turret. When the resistor expands and shrinks as it does in length, um, as it heats up, the lead has to have some relief in it. So, say you've got a component where the leads come straight out and then they're sold at either end, the length of this resistor is going to change when it heats and, heats and cools and that cracks the solder joints and causes in, intermittent problems. Usually they'll say, oh, the amp works right for about 10 minutes, 15 minutes and then it stops, stops working. That's problems like that. If you get them and put a little kink in it, now those little, that little kink has enough flex in it that it can take up that expansion and shrinkage and uh, doesn't affect the solder joint. So that's that's one reason to do it. So I might install the cap that I've got. is an FMT <clears throat> 47 microfarad 500 volts oh man this focusing is shit look there it is hello so look at the size comparison so the IC is about half the length again and bigger diameter so I'll just have to make sure I make make the leads a bit a bit more relief on the leads something like that I don't like it how you get them from the from the reseller and the leads are bent over at 90 degrees right at right at the edge sort of it's asking for failures particularly in a combo where stuff's rack, rack, rattling around so I just sort of prep it like that, just rough, get it in place and then fine tune it. <clears throat> so if she goes in that way, I'll get some of this silicon happening. I just need a tiny bit right on the bottom. Again, I'll make them so the writing's facing up. So Joe Blogs that works on the amp next 10 years, 20 years will know what I've been doing. Just a little scraping like that. Right on the bottom face. Squish it down. Fold over the leads. And solder away. Put the cap back on the silicon, that's a mistake you don't make twice. Cut off the excess. Sounds like I have a delivery, so I'll be back in a minute. 